Are you guys ready up there? Alright. Alright, quiet on the set. Welcome back to another episode of Adventures in Movies. My name is Blake. I'm your host for this evening's episode. Or this morning's, wherever you're listening. Who cares? Um, actually, man, I don't have anything prepared for this. Uh, this, is a great, this is a great podcast. I'm stumbling all over myself. <laughs> We're going to talk about movies. I'm joined by two gentlemen. One is the movie editor at AIPT. His name is Patrick. Goes by Nathaniel sometimes. What's up, bud? Uh, not much. And you're, we got an exciting podcast tonight. And, uh, I got an appetite for destruction. Yeah. And I'm going to yes. scrape the plate. <laughs> I'm hungry like the wolf. Danny, uh, our resident artist and uh, just all around great hair. Oh, amazing hair. Danny, what's up, man? Thank you. I mean, it's finger looking good. <laughs> it's always greasy. So it's always that's... greasy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is up, guys? Welcome to the last week of April. Hard to believe. It's it shot by, and uh, I still haven't found any COVID tussin at the Walgreens. <laughs> oh I've been looking. Haven't I, I've been it. making it in my closet, uh, so we can work out an arrangement here. <laughs> so the, the COVID testing is not like a plan B, where it's like over the table, over the counter? <laughs> oh, shit. It's not like plan B, so you can't get COVID and then immediately go take the test. And Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, there's, there's no day after for COVID, <laughs> unfortunately. Somebody needs to get on that. That would sell like hotcakes. Martin yeah, Screlly. I know. Martin Screlly needs to get on that. What's he up to? Is he in prison? Uh, he got sued by people. You know. <laughs> all I know guy. is he's got a Wu Tang album that everybody wants to hear. <laughs> anyway, so hey, so there is news, I presume, boys. Uh, what's up with AMC? Uh, yeah, I think it's like the new in in a crazy year of news. I think it's like one of the best news pit, bits of the year. Um, AMC is uh, dumping all Universal movies. Uh, going forward forever because they are upset that universal decided to show uh invisible man and i guess emma is in there and most especially trolls world tour uh which they made they've already made more money off of it than they did the original one and uh the head of amc not in these exact words said that uh you are messing up my profit margin so we will not be showing your movies anymore so um i figure in like march of 2021 they'll show a universal movie i was gonna say that doesn't sound like a good idea <laughs> well i i'm gonna i i want to say this uh as well i think it is hilarious but what makes this even better i'm i've got to read a little bit more about this right now i don't know if you guys could hear me on this but it says oh, yeah. um the po the policy this policy affects any and all universal movies per se goes into effect today uh and blah 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 and it is not some hollow or ill-considered threats. So he's saying, "Boo hoo hoo!" I'm crying here. I'm losing money. I'm hemorrhaging. I want, I want that univer that sweet, sweet Universal money. Uh, I mean, I think next year, like with Fast Nine coming out next year, like you know, that shit's gonna make yeah. a billion dollars. Uh, it's kind of funny because uh, I think Universal or AMC needs Universal more than the other way around because uh, AMC is constantly been in the news the past few weeks about possibly declaring for bankruptcy um i mean universal sitting pretty here uh it is kind of funny that amc essentially said you know what universal you bastards how dare you give people an option while they can't leave their house to still enjoy movies that's yeah. essentially what they did yeah. awesome yeah. stuff i, I, just, <laughs> I feel like it, it's so like they want to make money, they want to open this up this fucking economy, whatever you know. Who fucking cares right now? Like, what what, what happened to our well being? You know, like we're the ones that are going to be giving them money. Also, I haven't been to an AMC since God knows fucking when. You know, since maybe Pat, no, not even even before that. Uh, it's been like years since I've been to an AMC, and AMCs don't, didn't really exist here in El Paso either. So <laughs> I'm not missing out. So fuck. But, yeah, fuck them, first of all. <laughs> fuck, like, think of your fucking customers, dicks. Uh, oh, they never, I mean, that's, that's even before COVID, they didn't think about the, all they think about is the money. Yeah, yeah. The funny thing about, uh, like, I, I love going to movie theaters. I absolutely love it. Um, But, I mean, there's no way that 
I can see it from AMC side. I mean, it's just straight up like, yeah, there's a pandemic, but uh, I still got to make my money. I mean, that's essentially what it boils down to. Yeah, it, and that's I don't know. I yeah, I guess I'm with you in that. Like, I, I I don't side with them, but like at least like the two indie theaters or chains out here, like Alamo Draft House and Flex Brew House or whatever that shit's called, um, aren't opening here in Texas because they still don't have like a. I guess like an idea of what to do, how to do the six feet in social distancing. I mean, it's great and everything. And I guess as me, a, a consumer, I want to be safe. You know, like I want right. to see new fucking movies. I AMC is kind of like just coming in like, you know, balls out, you know, like, yeah, we're going to open up and damn everything. You know, I, I feel at least <laughs> if we have some sort of fucking like idea what's going to happen in the movie theater, we have, you, you know, I want to feel more protected you know shootings happen we got cops in there you know covid happens well i don't think that uh i'm I'm not defending amc but i don't think that they would go balls out on it i mean cinemark they they said that they were gonna roll it out slowly and they were only gonna fill up to like 50 percent capacity i don't think any well they wouldn't be allowed to in texas i mean it's only 25 percent capacity to begin with so there's no way that they'd be able to do that but i think the really funny thing i you know joking around about the money and all that stuff the funny thing is that yeah, Universal released. They released these movies that were in. They're from the dump months, basically. I mean, Trolls probably made more money than it ever would have made if it was just released in theaters. Mm-hmm. But there's no way that Universal would have put um, Fast Nine out there on on video on demand immediately if it were to right. go to the, that. There's no way that would happen. So AMC is just they're being little babies about it. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, they pushed it back, you know, a full year. So we know that for sure. You know, like even like Warner Brothers and Disney like pushed back some of their animated films or, you know, their weaker films maybe to be on video on demand or Disney Plus. That makes sense. If you don't feel that it's going to be making you the money, just put it in another service and that it will probably help you out. And I feel like AMC just wants some of that sweet, sweet money. (laughs) <laughs> Some well, I'm bucks. sure there. I'm sure there's an air of panic going on through all these theater companies at, at the at the moment. You know what I mean? So, I oh, I, I, get, I get that for sure. Uh, but on the on the topic of reopening, like, are you really? Would you if they reopened like tomorrow and it's 25 per, uh, percent uh, capacity and you could go and it was something you really wanted to see? Would you guys go? No. Like as of right now, what would they be showing? Uh, <laughs> no, I'm I'm <laughs> <Blue> <laughs> you know, I, I, I actually have thought about like, uh, and not this soon because Texas is opening on Friday. So I wasn't thinking like, who, what can I do this? What movie will I watch this weekend? <laughs> but um, right. I have thought like towards the end of the year or into the summer, like if things seem to be tailing off, like would I go? Um, definitely, definitely, definitely not. If there's a, if there's no limit, if it's a free for all, then no, I absolutely would not go. Um, at 25 to 50 percent i mean i don't know to be honest with you like i really do miss the theater experience but i also kind of enjoy being alive so yeah. <laughs> i don't know <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's 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 i mean I, I hate to say it but i I'm, i mean i keep it real <laughs> but uh <laughs> it would it would be a pretty tough decision for me to be honest with you and i that's that's, that's horrible but i guess i'm a loser like that no, I get it because I, I I would ha- I understand like the the weirdness about being in public places right now. Like I really have luckily with my job, I really don't have to be around people um, unless I'm like going to the store or something. Even then, I go to like a really tiny grocery store. Um, and, but today I was at I was at a a, a UPS store, and um, it's kind of like the first time I've been in like a like a thing that's usually really busy. And this it was actually no different. It was actually really busy, but super masked up and um social distancing tape on the floor kind of situation and right. uh it was totally uh it was a very it was unique uh it's the first time i've really experienced it where it felt really regimented and mm. uh yeah i'm not sure it i mean it immediately makes you feel uncomfortable is the best way i can put it like you're immediately on edge and not that you're like worried about people coughing and stuff but you just it puts you in a different state of mind and so, like, even then, I'm, like, thinking, like, well, if I was going to go to a movie theater and I'm sitting there with my fucking mask on and I got to take right. it off every time I want to take a drink of my fucking Mr. Pib, like, you know, that's, <laughs> like, fucking, I don't know. It's something I, I had thought about it, you know, and, uh, yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't be rushing out. Yeah, yeah it, it does kind of take away from the experience. I feel the same way. And I tell, like, you know, with this whole reopening here, at least in Texas, like, you know, 
I do feel like I want to get out of El Paso, but even like then, I'm like I have to wait a full year to feel even more comfortable to see like uh, like fucking you, Pat, you know, or fucking Pablo who's out in Austin. Like I would still wait a whole time. Like even then, I don't feel comfortable traveling or going to you know fucking a movie theater. Like the well, grocery store. You're supposed to like quarantine yourself after you travel. Like more than 100 miles, you should you should technically yeah. keep yourself sec- you know separated. So, yeah. yeah, but I mean, like even the like because and this is so like so stupid because we don't know what who has it and you what you were mentioning with the mask. Like yeah, yeah. it's so like I, I I went to a McDonald's inside of Walmart and then I I got my coffee and I was like oh fuck I can't drink my coffee until I'm actually in my car in my you know in my little safe zone, yeah. my little bubble that dry, you know and I was like fuck this sucks like I, I didn't yeah. think about that. No, people but, are definitely yeah. uncomfortable around uh, around every, and especially me since it was a leather face mask. But uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> Pat, <'Cause> you're a <laughs> leather daddy. <laughs> <I'm> a leather. <laughs> uh, last drive in, man. Tell me about it. Oh man, so last drive in, uh, they had uh, Chris Jericho on as the co-host, and uh, he was awesome. He sang a little number. Apparently, he's a huge. I don't know, Blake. Have you ever seen Blood Sucking Freaks? Oh yeah, of course. Man, that movie, I, I, I've i seen it, right? Probably, yeah. uh, God, high school, maybe, but... <laughs> oh, I mean, I've, yeah, a long time ago. That movie, it, it, I remember watching it back then and being like, oh, wow, this is some crazy stuff. Oh, it's the director, still... It's, uh, what's his face? Uh, uh, Gordon Lewis or something? No, no, that's... Uh, he does the other... Uh, he, I thought it was that one, too, the, um, the guy who does Wizard of Gore, right? Yeah, yeah, is it uh, not that? Yeah. No, 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 it's a different one. It, that one, because that one... That one is like a thousand freaks or like something like where they're stuck in the oh. county, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Like Blood Sucking Freaks is set in the seventies. The what? Maybe I'm thinking of a completely different movie. I'm gonna look it up while you're talking. Okay, so the Blood Sucking Freaks is, is in the seventies and it's about it's kind of similar to Wizard of Gore. It's this wizard who has a um uh an assistant and his show is based on torture. Um oh, every, is, except it's not a show. He's really yeah. torturing people. Yeah, and, uh, okay. Essentially, the movie is filled with, like, you know how Joe Bob does the uh, drive-in totals beforehand? It, it was 76 boobs was the first thing that came out. So, <laughs> nice. like, it's filled with nudity and S&M and torture and naked women being used as seats and tables and people being uh, people being whipped. Uh, there's necrophilia. Um, did, did Anton LaVey direct this? <laughs> you know what? The guy kind of looked like Anton LaVey, actually. <laughs> um, a severed head giving head to a dwarf, which is <laughs> one of the most surreal scenes you'll ever see. Um, yeah, super strange movie, uh, but um, infamous um, for for the right reasons. And then the other movie they showed, uh, Kelly Maroney. She was uh, like a, a, a scream queen of the 80s, but it was a chopping, chopping Mall. Have you ever seen chopping that one? Mall, yes, the robots. Recap like the robots, <laughs> the robots, the whole have a nice day thing. Yeah, um, it's actually, actually, it's a very fun movie. It's super silly. It's really, really crazy, crazy fun. Uh, Barbara Crampton in it. Um, the uh, I've actually never seen it before. I have never. Wow. I've heard of it. I know because it's so. You always. I think the Alamo has showed it a few times. Like it's. Yeah. But I, I just have never gotten around to seeing it. So uh, I had a chance to see it, and uh, yeah, it was. Uh, <laughs> It's, it lives up to to its uh, cult status. It's it must have come fun. out like uh, during the like Johnny Five uh, short circuit, like that whole era of eighty. That's basically he's a mix of Johnny Five, Ed Two Hundred Nine, and RoboCop. <laughs> yeah, is yeah. What it amounts to. <laughs> but it's a mall it's, security fucking buy. But but it's a mall security buy. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> There's like three of them. And, oh uh, yeah, so, it's, it's so somebody needs to do a, a comic crossover of mall uh, mall rats and uh, <laughs> chopping. I, I have a question. <laughs> yes. What's better, uh, Paul Bart Mall Cop or Chopping Mall? You know what? <laughs> Paul Bart's mall. actually got some amazing, <laughs> amazing moments in it. But no, it's Chopping Mall. <laughs> yeah, Chopping Mall is. Uh, you know, I, I think the original name is Killbots, they said, or something like that. But uh, Chopping Mall, it's such like, a, you're like, oh, what a stupid name. Like, they're obviously uh, trying to be bad, but I don't think they were trying to be bad. Well, actually, the story is that uh, uh, Roger Corman told the writer, like, if you can write a movie set in a mall with robots, if you can write a movie for me, sure, you can direct it. And the guy wrote it up in 24 hours. Oh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> that was some coke he was on. You, you oh. can totally tell. Also, it's uh, but it's so it's, it's a creepy pasta. God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> um, so this week, um, 
they they don't announce the movies ahead of time. But the guest this week is a uh, Tom Savini. So oh, uh, oh so yeah. if you go to his website right now, and if you are a Halloween person, and I would do, totally do this, but I think they're expensive. You can buy a protective mask that is like a half uh, Jason Voorhees Friday the Thirteenth mask from Tom Savini himself. Oh. Oh, that's pretty awesome. That's actually. Uh, Tom Savini, in, in my opinion, the the head explosion scene in Maniac is the, well, maybe Videodrome might be, I, I don't know, that that head explosion scene in Maniac. Do you remember that one? Uh, in uh, Maniac? With, yeah, with a shotgun blast. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. The only that, rivals that is, by Scanner. Only rivals yeah, by Scanner. Yeah, Scanner. I said Drill. Yes. Those are two. I, I love that one. In, and Tom Savini plays the victim. Yes. And it's I, just... It's so, I love Tom so awesome. He's one of my favorite ho- people in the horror genre. Like, uh, and his little sp- uh, little segment in uh, From Dust Till Dawn, very, very memorable. Sex oh, machine, he's great. Uh, sex machine, yes, <laughs> he's awesome. Uh, but yeah, he's going to be on this week. So uh, like, yeah. I'm sure they'll ask him about the maniac thing, and I'm sure they'll ask him about Friday Thirteenth and Dawn of the Dead and uh, all the stuff that he's done. He's uh, there's a lot of horror icons. They're mainly you know Stephen King and Pinhead and. Uh, who had George Romero, um, but the special effects people in horror, especially from the seventies and eighties, yep. are very Rick important. And Tom Savini is a yep. he's an absolute legend. Yep. Um, so uh, last week uh, um, I had a theme going where I had seen um, a bunch of Netflix movies. Uh, this week I have a kind of an unintentional theme that I didn't realize until after the fact. But uh, if you haven't listened to um, Adventures in Movies, looks at dot dot dot. We did four ninety nine, which is about uh, basically the conquest of uh, of Mexico. Uh, so I saw two movies that are very similar to that. Uh, not quite that like weird level of creativity, but really similar. So I saw a movie called uh, The Infiltrators. Um, it's about the uh, National Immigrant Youth Alliance. Have you, have you guys heard of them? No. Negative. So they did this crazy thing. I, I, it's one of those things where you can't, you can't believe you, you, you never would have heard of this. Uh, they intentionally got themselves detained at one of those for-profit de- de- detention centers where they house immigrants. Um, they got intentionally detained there in order to break people out. Um, it's 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 a pretty crazy plan. So it, it's the weird thing about this is it's a documentary. They have the actual people from the from the the um, organization there, but it's also dramatized. So it's kind of like, and it's I guess it's like an unsolved mysteries type of thing going on, where um, they have interviews and talking heads, but then there's dramatizations of the the prison the prison escape. So it's a documentary prison escape movie, basically, is what you get. Um, it's really really engrossing, and the tension's super high. Like, and the it's just a crazy premise, you know, guys purposely get uh, arrested by ICE so they can get out of a detention center and free everybody. It's a really crazy story. Um, the only problem I had with it was uh, the dramatized parts, like the the warden and the guards and stuff like that. They're very one note villains, like the twirl their mustache type villains. Uh, so pretty generic <laughs> stuff. But I yeah. love those kind of villains. Oh my god! Normally Snidely they're whip. cool. Yeah, like the Snidely Whiplash dudes are cool and like over the top stuff. And prison move, prison escape movies are over the top. But since this was a true story documentary, <laughs> it kind of <laughs> kind of didn't work. Out, so. Oh, but, not true. But the actual premise is super interesting. It's really crazy that people would be willing to do that to free uh, other people. And um, the people in the the uh, Youth Alliance, they're also um, uh, um, illegal immigrants also. So it's a super – and the, the actors in this are also undocumented. So it's a really interesting – it's an interesting story. It's cool. Lots of cool tension. The escape stuff is really cool. Uh, it, it's, it's definitely worth a watch. It, then the other thing I saw, now this thing we talked about how four ninety nine has it obviously has you know a, a time traveling conquistador is obviously fiction. Uh, I saw a movie called uh, "The Things We Dare Not Do." Um, it's about a sixteen year old boy who's uh, coming out, and he's struggling with telling his parents about it. And pretty typical story. Um, usually, those types of movies they either take place in like an urban setting, or they take if it's not in an urban setting, then it's like. In this really picturesque, like like Brokeback Mountain type of thing, I, I think it's usually that because it's kind of uh, they have um, the ugliness of, of people being closed minded set against this really beautiful backdrop type of thing. So in this movie, it takes place in a 
in this little village in Mexico where they're they're happy just to have running water because it happens like one day out of so it's uh, kind of neat in that you don't really get that setting very often in these kinds of stories. This movie, what's really really weird about it is I didn't even know it was a documentary until about and halfway in maybe more than halfway in because it it blends the fiction and the documentary part like seamlessly like like in uh in 499 you can tell what's i mean it's pretty obvious what's what's fiction and what's what's real in this movie there's you have no idea it does it never tells you there's no narration like you just kind of figure it out on your own it becomes a little obvious but um the problem with that is documentaries like uh they'll they'll set you up with like clues and motivation and you know the setting and all that and then they kind of give you that big bang and then uh whereas in coming out movies they'll kind of set you up with characters and they'll kind of let you know why it's difficult for these people to come out um in here it's really slow paced to where it does introduce and the direction is beautiful and you get an idea of the main character like you you understand who he is he's like a father figure to the children in this village but it moves so so slow to where at, at a point you're kind of like okay like what's 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 this about like i'm i'm just i'm just watching this boy who likes to wear dresses and that's cool but i mean where's this going and then eventually is this michael like, stipe <laughs> <laughs> it's it's the mexican michael stipe and eventually Miguel. there's a murder <laughs> um, there's a there's a murder and the murder is obviously it's uh there's hints of machismo around it uh um the victim isn't at least they don't say that he's gay but he is a little effeminate so um it's kind of the whole machismo thing into that so that makes the coming out decision a little bit more difficult for the main character it's a pretty typical story uh, the idea to blend the fiction and, and, and documentary, which I saw so much of this past week, it, it's not a bad idea. It's just, it's done, uh, I, I don't know if I would have made that. It just melds it, and it's so slow that it kind of, once it picks up the pace, and I mean, that's being very generous with that, like, it, it draws you in a little bit more, but by the time it's over, you're just like, okay. <laughs> that's, very, that's a very well shot movie like that's the best i can say uh, it's I, I don't know i mean if you're into geez i don't even know like cinematography yeah, if you love beautiful cinematography then i don't know if you'd find anything better but it's not anything that i would go out of my way to see what did you uh see it on uh that was released at the the canadian uh, the canada hot docs festival okay they had a virtual okay. showing of it i see i see so the things we dare not do uh danny now that we know the things we dare not do, what about Never Have I Ever? I went down on a Netflix binge, uh, unlike Pat here. Uh, I don't have a the- like a theme, usually. I just watch what I, I guess I like to watch. <laughs> so Never Have I Ever is a comedy... Uh, uh, what's it called? Pat usually says this a lot. It's a coming-of-age dramedy from Netflix, and it's, it was created by Mindy Kaling of... Uh, the Office fame, I guess. Uh, if that's if you don't have if you haven't seen her show, the Mandy Kaling show on Fox or Hulu, uh, she made this nice little uh, teen drama. Are you referring to the Mindy Project? The Mindy Project. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know what the name of the show is. I never saw it. I saw her in Champions. Uh, the Mindy Kaling <laughs> Experience. <laughs> I wanted to call once uh, when I was growing up. I wanted to have a band named the Brandon Boyd Experience. Oh, and... would have. Oh my god. <laughs> How did you not end up with a red tattoo? I don't know. I don't know. But it, <laughs> uh, back to the show. It, it, I, I benched all 10 episodes. Uh, the trailer really got my attention. Essentially, this girl has this tragic experience while at a band recital, and she loses her ability to walk. So for a whole year, you know, her whole freshman year, she's just... Was it a flute accident? Sorry, I had to. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, it it was a heart attack. Her, she saw her dad die. Oh, God, God damn it! <laughs> oh, Regina lied to me. She said that the show was cute. <laughs> well, it's it. So that's I think the darkest part of the whole show, the first ten ten minutes uh, of it. Uh, but get it out of the way. <laughs> yeah. So she's trying to like you know sh- trying to struggle with being a teenager, and she wants to go to Princeton. She wants to be, you know, this whole all-American girl, but she's socially awkward. She's trying to break, you know, like we were all teenagers. So it kind of like hits a lot of it. Uh, 
it has a lot of the same tropes that you see in now modern teen shows and uh, it's kind of weird yeah teen comedy shows and kind of like this like the the YA movies it, it, it's just really really cute I think it was well done the acting from all the main leads the three young ladies are really really good um and uh, the 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 surprise the surprise to me is shoot and I'm gonna mispronounce his name uh, John McEnroe 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 yeah, that's, about right. <laughs> that's right he's like the narrator isn't he yeah he's the narrator Johnny yeah. Bat yeah I was walking through the living room the other day I was like is that, that's what I, said. I was like I was like, is that Mac Attack he is the the highlight of the show because oh, he's bad. he's how old he's like you know. I'm... It, He's yeah. 56. He's and so he's narr- <laughs> he looks really good, by the way. And it's this weird thing that you he's narrating a teenager's life and he's like, I have no idea what the fuck's going on. You know, like, just pay attention. Uh, and it's really, really those are the bits that I really like, I think are laugh out funny. But some of the situations are very funny. Obviously, she loses, you know, like every fucking teen sh- movie. She loses connections with friends because she's selfish. Uh, she thinks she's not. Uh, it's really well. So I feel like if you want a, a chipper show, I feel this is a great show. I I fucking watched all ten episodes in one sitting. So damn. Yeah. How long was that sitting? Jesus Christ. Uh, I think it was like five hours long. I think that's how wow. much I calculated. But you know, like it was fun. Like yeah, because they're half hour each. Oh, okay. So yeah. So I mean, they're not bad. And like I had to stretch once in a while. Uh, <laughs> but uh. The thing, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. I really thought it was really good. Some of the, I don't want to spoil too much, uh, but it was, uh, it's cute. It's very, very cute, despite the, the, the dark opening of the show. Also, I got to, I'm continuing to watch Miss America. Uh, this episode dealt with a character named B- Betty, played by Tracy Ullman. And I just want to say this. If Tracy Ullman doesn't get nominated for an Emmy, uh everything is just fucked because threaten, threaten the shit out of him, Danny threaten yeah, I, or what, I, or what, you know, <laughs> or I'm going to will get nominated. She, she always gets nominated. And I'm, she it seems like she always wins also. So I, I'd Ullman, be surprised. Really? If, That's good. Really? I, ever I since like... the Tracy Ullman, yeah, ever since the Tracy Ullman oh. show, I think she, she won after it was canceled. Like she constantly <laughs> wins awards. I hope I, she I doesn't feel... win. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel, I feel like this is showing her dramatic, prowess i've never seen her as a dramatic actor like i've always known her as a comedic actor um so to me seeing her like this vulnerable and just fucking good like she has a really good monologue and a good breakdown right after slightly after that i just feel it's a really 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 good acting from her um especially going against like kate blanchett which you know she could also do almost anything. Uh, she go. She, she went to just a creature, and I mean that in the best way possible. <laughs> she is a creature. She, can, she could do anything. And I feel like this is this is a really good show. Showing again a weird right wing feminist movement that we don't really get to see a lot, or it's not really talked about. I guess if, with liberal studies. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I really, I'm really enjoying the show. Like every single time, it's kind of like a gut, re- like a gut punch, because everything just like sucks at the end. You're like, fuck. Well, what's gonna happen now? You know, like it, it's very good, and I feel like FX has something on. The- FX is doing really good right now with with this show and uh, you know other shows that they I haven't seen. Um, and then <laughs> like what we do in the it. shadows. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was gonna say that. Hilarious. Uh, this past that's the best. Uh, and continuing, Danny watches a sports documentary saga. Oh, let's uh, talk about it, Danny. I watched it with you this time. Uh, let's talk. Nice, 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 nice. So episode three and four, uh, episode three had to do with Dennis Rodman, and episode four did dealt, dealt with Phil Jackson. Last Fuck. dance. Sorry, I interrupted you. The last dance. No, no, yeah, the last dance. Um, I thought I said that, but you know. I don't know if you did. <laughs> so, man, this show just gets... Better and you know, comparing Scotty Pippen to the Dennis Rodman episode, I think I was more of a Dennis Rodman fan growing <laughs> up because I think he was so like Electra, uh, Electra, Carmen Electra. <laughs> oh, dude, dude, also Carmen Electra, like she was more for the MTV generation. 
Oh, uh, and you're not. Don't give me oh, that. Shit. I am a. Yeah, no, no. That's. I think that's why I. I was like, oh, I have Dennis Rodman and Cameron Electric. That's like peanut butter and chocolate right there. Yeah. yeah. What well, could be better? Maybe Dave Navarro. <laughs> Ugh. Anyways. Anyway. Uh, I feel like this the Dennis Rodman episode was a well better written episode compared to the Scotty Pippen one. We got to see the growth of Dennis Rodman. I don't feel like. I don't know if you saw the Scotty Pippen episode, Blake. But uh, I, yeah, I, I did. You did? Yeah. Okay. So I feel like when we we got the the growth of him, and then we got the fucking De- Detroit Pistons, which if you saw the 30 for 30, these guys are just like the bullies. Like they are the, bad one boys. of the bad, the bad boys. Yeah. The bad boys. Yeah. Oh, you got the Jordan rules. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And they talk about that too. Yeah. And it, it's kind of this weird thing that you see them like, I never. Th- thought about it. and even after like the seeing the 30 for 30 episode um i never thought of like the bulls and the pistons being like rivals like they're a complete fucking nemesis like they oh, went head- yeah so i it- remember when they uh i remember when they froze jordan out of the all-star game i remember when the pistons walked off the court like yep. which is, and then jordan the did the quick- exact same thing to isaiah thomas for the dream team right. so they yeah. they so he he wouldn't even let isaiah thomas on the dream team who was coached by his coach yeah Chuck Daly. yeah yeah so i i feel like it's so good like the drama in that episode is so great and even like like Isaiah thomas is like talking about like if we knew what we knew back then you know it would have been different but it was over the time and <laughs> and jordan's like pretty much like fuck him like he's just full <laughs> of shit he's full of shit like and it's so good it like i feel like it's so great and then, I love Michael Jordan. He is the sorest winner of all fucking oh, time. He is, oh, he is so bitter about, and it's like, dude, you're on top. You're the literally everyone thinks you're the goat, and yet yeah. you still hate everybody. Yeah, like I, it's crazy. Honestly, like, I think it is. It's crazy. It's crazy. It's so it's weird. funny that the the Hall of Fame, his Hall of Fame speech, what everyone got out of it was the crying Jordan meme. Right. But uh, <laughs> the actual speech is oh, one of the most shit. spiteful things you will ever hear. <laughs> he talked shit to people that he played against in high school. Yeah, high school. He was a high school people. It's he, nuts. Yeah. And those are things that you kind of get from the documentary that he's like, I'm the greatest shit ever. And you're not paying respect to me. And like by the time that we get Phil Jackson in, it, in there, it's it, it, he's there. He's like, hey, dude, like, chill the fuck out. Like, Phil Jackson's like, look it, there's other players. Maybe pass the ball to them. And uh, what's his name, Paxson? Um, I yeah, was, John Paxson. I was like, holy shit! Like, you're not like they're co- they're covering your fucking ass. So obviously, you need to like play oh, the, the end ball. of that episode where he's talking about Paxson at the end of that one episode is mm-hmm. truly great. Like, that's oh, a, yeah, it is. It is Jordan being like, hey, guess holy shit, uh, Phil's right. I don't have to do it all myself. Yeah. Which is which? Jordan, if it weren't for that mentality, he wouldn't have won three more cha- or you know four more championships after right. that, or right or five. Was that five. the first? Was that the ch- first that, championship? That was against that, the Lakers, the right? Champ- yeah, that's the incredible. First one. That's just incredible, man. It, it is. I, it's just it's the really well, and I don't know if it's breaking the mold for Jordan or like or whatever we have him in a pedestal. But I feel like as we see him, like as I see this last year, I, I just feel like cool and. It's just, it's really great storytelling. It's just, right. It's just that, like, you know. So and- I will say this about this whole thing, though. You know, um, all this stuff was, all this footage was being taken back then um, yeah. under Jordan's supervision, right? And um, this whole thing, I kind of, I've, I've only learned about this recently. Um, this whole documentary only came to be. Um, because Jordan finally, I think the the rumor is that he watched LeBron win his his last championship, um, and fi- and told the filmmakers that you know what, put it together, start putting this together, and it's taken obviously several years since that yeah. since that happened. But um, I think that also goes to show you the competitive nature of Michael Jordan. He, he want he wanted people now to remember, and this would be think about it. This would be possibly being released during the NBA playoffs, you know, for, uh, you know, LeBron and the Lakers might be in the playoffs right now um, with this, with this being released with Jordan. So think about that, right? So Jordan is such a competitor 
that he wants everybody now to remember how good he was. And it just so happened that we're all locked up in our houses in a pandemic and everybody's watching it, including yeah. LeBron James. So yeah. like there is there is an aspect of this that I think everybody needs to take with like the tiniest grain of salt and be like, you know what, this wouldn't be released if it wouldn't for Michael Jordan giving his big check mark yeah. to everything. It's just it's again, it shows you how petty he is, like in so many ways yeah. that it's competitive. Competitive. It's yeah, yeah. Competitive. It, it, it's so it's great. Like I love it. Like fucking keep it up. Like I want to see more of this shit. And I and I will. Uh what did you see, Mr. Blake? <laughs> so I've much like stuff that happened twenty five years ago. I wanted to rewatch something. Um and so uh I really I've other than like uh, Last Dance and just some superfluous other stuff. Um, that doesn't really count. I watched uh, Alice in Chains Unplugged. Un- incredible. Go, so go watch Alice in Chains Unplugged. It's I think it's all on YouTube. Um, I, I sat on my computer and, and, and got real depressed and watched the shit out of it, but it was, <laughs> but it was real, real good. Um, uh, but I did watch uh, Bone Tomahawk, which is a movie I've talked about uh, a couple times uh, on here. And it is... I, I know it's kind of mixed. I, I know it doesn't always have... The best review. I know our friend Pablo, who's been on the show, uh, he's not a huge fan of it, but it's Kurt Russell was it. about <laughs> yeah yeah he hates it. <laughs> he thinks it's boring and slow. <laughs> but Kurt Russell's got an incredible beard and mustache, and it's got a bunch of really incredible performances by um, Patrick Wilson, Matthew Fox, Richard Jenkins. It's it's good. It's very very good. There's a uh, there, and then there's other uh, little cameos that you'll that you'll notice. Um, but a uh, a brutal movie, a horror movie, a Western horror movie, uh, which is right up my alley. Um, and it, I think I still think it really holds up. Um, I hadn't watched it in a while. Um, it is slow. It is kind of a long movie. I didn't. I I'd kind of forgotten how long it was. It's uh, how long is it? Two hours, twelve minutes. So and that's and you know, there's a lot of walking. So there's a lot of walking around and talking and stuff. But like it, again, it's kind of a throwback, kind of like uh, what we've been talking about lately with some of this other stuff on the YouTube channel and stuff. Um, but it's uh, yeah, an incredibly well done movie. And uh, again, if you you know you're at home, you got two hours to kill, and you want to watch a horror western with uh, highly aggressive native peoples and a hostage situation that may or may not turn out for the best. I highly recommend Bone Tomahawk. Um, which is a far departure and a terrible way to segue into no, our wait, main hold topic. On. Hold on. I do have a question <laughs> before okay. we segue. Where Go did ahead. you see – I have never seen this movie, and I know you and Pablo have talked about it, but I never have a chance. You never – Where I did own you it. stream it? I oh, you own it. it. Yeah, I own it. <laughs> you son of a bitch. Never mind then. Let's go on to food. Hey, dude, you're supposed to give me a spicy pickle beer. We can. Still I still have them. That's awesome. Okay, well, let's talk. Yeah, let's talk. Yeah. Okay, perfect segue. You know what makes me want to, to, to eat something? It's a spicy pickle beer. Uh, we're, on top of being stoned for 20 months into for 20 months. Uh, here we are at the end. Um, <laughs> we thought it'd be fun to talk about movies that make you hungry, movies that have uh, a food tie-in. And uh, I, boy, howdy, do I want to hear what these guys have to say. About <laughs> what stuff is. So, Patrick, we're going to go off your little main segment list here, which I love. Uh, favorite dish for a movie. Let's start there, guys. Let's start there. That is one tasty burger. <laughs> oh, are you kidding me? Oh, I have it on the, my list. <laughs> the big kahuna. It's because Quentin Tarantino oh, knows look. how to shoot food. He does. Uh, yeah. I mean, the, does. the nachos and Death Proof, fucking amazing. <laughs> like, but nothing. I've never seen any food look better than the Big Kahuna Burger. <laughs> when uh, <laughs> it, that's like the way the cheese is kind of dripped over that burger is melted perfectly oh, on there. Yeah. And how's, how refreshing does that that Sprite sound or whatever it is? <laughs> <laughs> it's like a fucking food commercial. It's I crazy eat beverage. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that Hawaiian burger joint, right? Like, it's, it's, oh, that's uh, so funny. I had that on the top of my list, Pat. That's the best thing in the world. It's like the be- it's the best food. Well, it's the best single food item ever. I went a completely different route. Like I was naming like Quint- uh, Tarantino films, and I was thinking like Inglorious Bastards and like fucking uh, Kill Bill, and yeah, the shooter part. I was like, fuck. And then I was just ended up talking about like how he does food like just justice 
yeah. everything that you in the especially in Pulp Fiction, I think, because uh, it's also the shake that Uma Thurman drinks uh, at the okay. I, I don't remember at the, the diner. Jack- Rabbit Slims. Yeah, and so all that, all that shit. I was like, "Fuck yeah!" This is like all that made me crave it. And I think when we're like talking about this whole like idea, I was like, "Well, what movie does does it <laughs> makes me horny for food?" And <laughs> like you know, like I'm like I'm salivating, salivating, salivating. I'm drooling. There you go. I'm drooling. Salivate. I'm drooling. I'm foaming. Um. As I mentioned, horny. That's the COVID uh, kicking in. Creamy, creamy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I thought of Chef, and I went, I went down to a freaking line, like a whole like row of fi- films, like, uh, like, and that not necessarily to have to deal with a lot of food, but I went like down with Hook, where you know he finally imagines like the fucking Batarang. yeah, the battering, the whole thing, that whole fucking feast. I was like, oh, that was really cool. And then I thought of Home Alone too with a cheese pizza. Like, I was just like trying to think like what made me really fucking hungry, like. <laughs> like what do I want to have at the end of, of of this? And chef, I came out like wanting cubanos, like or Cubans. Like I was like, holy shit! Like I've never had one of these sandwiches, and having to hear one in El Paso was kind of disappointing. But uh, I all time like... cubano show was Dexter. Dexter was always eat, always eating cubano sandwiches. Really, I've never seen Dexter. What? So, uh, yeah, watch, never... watch the first five seasons. Worth it. Okay. Worth it. Okay, but yeah, that was one of the things, and then obviously they go to the, like Austin and do like the fucking brisket at Franklin's. So that that movie is all about the food, even the the grilled cheese sandwiches that they have in that movie. Like everything is like kind of like like food porn essentially, and <sighs> everything for me was I was like, oh man, all that looks really good, and I just want to have it in my belly. And then uh, I had I we I rewatched Ratatouille. Um, and I wanted to share this story because I feel it, it, I think it goes with a favorite dish from a movie. Uh, I'm Mexican descent, and uh, we have a peasant food that they usually call in this movie ratatouille, and uh, it's essentially just soup squash. And I hated the shit out of it. I, I think this movie came out like in 2007, and my mom was like, "Well, have this," and she kind of made it into you know like mid 20s, whatever. And she's like putting it on a plate for me. It's like here taste this this is completely different now and uh it made me change my whole <laughs> like idea of what a squash soup is because of ratatouille so uh ratatouille thank you you made my that that would i would say that favorite dish from a movie is ratatouille because it <laughs> it's good <laughs> have you ever had ratatouille the actual dish no no i i have my mom's version of ratatouille which is squash <laughs> so just just well i mean it's not too different not too different, yeah. I think it needs eggplant and some sort of tomato thing. Yeah, it's like a tomato sauce. Yeah, it's basically a bunch of vegetables with tomato sauce. <laughs> but it is, it is very good. <laughs> no, no. We're just going to end up talking about food right now. I can totally do that. Did you guys Did you guys kill somebody for a fucking Popeye sandwich last year? I, I'm sure you did. Um, so, <laughs> uh, movies with the best food. Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, I was... Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. I was gonna. I was gonna say that I was. I immediately thought of mob movies because I've been watching The oh, Sopranos. So, so, in mob movies, like there's always that. <laughs> there's always that. Yeah, they, they hang out in Italian restaurants, and then there's always a scene where there's a huge wedding, or someone turns sixteen, or it's a graduate, and there's this huge feast afterwards. Yeah. And then I really thought about. It. I was like, you know, it's not just exclusive to mob movies. It's basically any movie that deals with another culture. Like my big fat Greek wedding. Um, yeah. I recently saw the farewell. So any movie uh, um, that deals with uh, <laughs> with Asians or Mexicans, or <laughs> they joke when they go to England. Uh, like basically, if it's a, if uh, it's a movie released in America and they want to uh, introduce you to the culture, they introduce <laughs> you through food. That's like the, the easiest way to do it. So. Uh, yeah. But the ones that stick out the most to me are the anything to do with the mafia. And uh, my big fat Greek wedding has lots of scenes with delicious looking food in it. <laughs> so I'm going to go kind of the other way with it. But a movie, a scene, it's basically just a scene that always just stands out in my mind. It's just I always find super hilarious is from, um, I guess it's a Christmas Vacation. National <laughs> Christmas Vacation. And so... <laughs> 
Clark, Clark Griswold <laughs> has, has been slaving over a Christmas feast for his entire family, who's and some of whom have showed up unexpectedly. There's a dog. There's a cat. There's lots of madness. And uh, he's cooked this fucking turkey to death. And when he, when he stabs into it to, like, carve it up, it deflates like a fucking football. Like a football. <laughs> And then it goes around like in the next few scenes or the next scene, just kind of showing them all like trying to chew on it, like eat it. Like, oh, my God, <laughs> it is so funny. And it's funny. That's just like Christmas movies. But the also the other scene, very similar, very similar sense of humor here. Obviously, I'm a big fan of turkey fucking comedy is <laughs> the fucking scene in A Christmas Story when the dogs break into the house and eat the entire uh, oh, Christmas <laughs> And they have to go to a Chinese restaurant with the fara ra ra ra. I mean, it's just it's one of the most like iconic, ridiculous scenes in history, and it's all uh, it's all food. That one's really good with the with the duck. How she screams, and he's like, uh, it's it's smiling at her. <laughs> yeah. Oh, such good stuff. I mean, but if I really think about it, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of like iconic food scenes in movies. Uh, I guess Harry Potter has a huge. Uh, there's a lot of people that love the the food scene in uh, in those movies and just the and even in the books. I know yeah. that's like a that's a big thing. Um, and it made me think just now, actually, Danny. Is there is there a is there any comics or art that's uh, kind of like bizarrely food based that is that is actually kind of cool? Or is there anything yeah. like Chew, Chew, Chew? Yeah. Okay. So the Dude, detective, the detective is a vegetarian, but anytime he eats. A thing, uh, he knows where what happened to it. He, he gets the life story of it, and so he chews body parts to figure out what happened to oh, those. Uh, oh my god, this is incredible! Yeah, yeah, this just ended a couple of years back, I think. Uh, but yeah, this is a really fucking great story. Uh, fuck, I'm trying to think of other ones. I know Anthony Bourdain made a comic book. I don't really know much about it, uh, but I feel there's like so many like food. Like, if you're thinking of, like food centric comics, I think that's the biggest one I could think of. Like, chew. okay, honestly, um, I was taking a shot. Dark hair. I was like, I'm putting him on the spot. I gotta ask, but no, you nailed it. That's <laughs> that's pretty incredible. I was. I, was I, I bet there's a uh, lots of manga about cooking. Uh, I was, they yeah, always... yeah, <laughs> there is too. I was gonna say this: the best, the best scene out of an anime, and you guys are gonna fucking laugh. Uh, it's Cowboy Bebop, the movie. He is eating a cup of noodles, uh, or cup noodles. and But the fucking greatest thing ever is this technology. And I think this is where I want technology to go to. Is at the bottom of the cup, he pulls a string. And his instant noodles are instantly hot. And it, it maybe he had water. I don't really remember. <laughs> but I want that. You I want to be able to pull a string and make things hot. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's... <laughs> It is one of my favorite food scenes, I think. Uh, but also, also, I was also thinking of V for Vendetta, uh, eggs in the basket mm-hmm. scene, where he's introducing, or where V is introducing that to Natalie Portman's character, uh, Eve, I think. I don't fucking remember her name. Uh, <laughs> but I, I feel like I was remembering that as we were talking about it. And then Parasite also had something recently as well. Oh, Parasite had a great food scene. I was wondering if that was going to come up, actually. Yeah. That had a, a fantastic food scene. Um, this is a really great uh, little talking point. Uh, things that would lose your appetite. That was most of the things on my list. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought I had a, I thought I had a long list, but um, the only movie right now that comes so stuff like Cannibal Holocaust or eh, Hostel, right. that stuff doesn't. Yeah, it's like kind of uncomfortable. In, in Cannibal Holocaust case, it's uncomfortable. In Hostel's case, it's I guess it's gross or whatever. But it's not one of those like you know gag me with a spoon type of thing right. but um <laughs> Sal- Salo, the Ooh. or the 100 180 yeah. days of uh, Sodom, that movie and uh i guess it's kind it of a has copperphilia in it yeah i'm not <laughs> yeah, like there's literal yeah it's, it's pretty literal and disgusting but um getting away from people literally eating shit uh <laughs> the, vi- <laughs> the the violence in it it's it's pretty. Oh, yeah. It's pretty That's horrible. Right. Yeah. What they make these kids do to each other and to them. It's a, uh, like the final scene is. Um, it's really, really, really bad. Like, uh, hot pokers in people's open eyes type of thing. And and no, I mean these are dead on scenes where they're showing them straight up. Like nothing is left to your imagination. So, 
it's really gory to watch. It's uh, very graphic. And, uh, yeah, it's some pretty realistic-looking shit that's going. This ain't no two girls in a cup stuff. Like, this looks. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't eat orange leaf after that. I have. Uh, we went, uh, so, Alamo Draft House. And I, we talked about the story plenty of times. You're right. The food is totally disgusting. Yeah. <laughs> Super disgusting. <laughs> Uh, no, uh, they so, so we got to see Hereditary and uh, they gave us cake. And I think this is the only time that I really put my fork down. And uh, so I think, can we spoil this movie at this yeah, point? Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I wasn't really sure, but she loses her head, you know, the little girl. And uh, right after the birthday party scene, you know, before the whole scene, they kind of just gave us this like piece of chocolate <laughs> cake. And that was the first time that I feel like you hear audible like in unison like everybody just dropping their fork gross yeah because i feel that was not the only oh no pat Pat was like (laughs) oh give me more uh i took i took danny's cake more more decapitated head please (laughs) yeah i'll take what he's having uh no that was the only time i'll have what she's having (laughs) that was the, the, the first time i feel like i was like no thank you because for the most everything oh. else seems... oh that's really funny that's really funny so okay so i have three i'm just gonna keep it to three i have more but i'm gonna keep it to three so uh so the one thing i just want everybody to like uh youtube google search search house house is house four that's the movie house number four house volume four i'm your pizza man all right <laughs> God, it, I'll, both you guys do that right now for me i'll, I'll keep talking so this is it's uh, so the story of house uh, there's obviously several of them um a guy buys a haunted house and he starts to renovate it and su- uh, supernatural happenings uh persist and in this one in this particular edition of house 4 they order pizza this has been burned into my memory since i was a child i don't know why every time i order a pizza i expect it to spit at me so it's they order a pizza it gets delivered the pizza sings a song and then it spits hot pizza in their fucking face. It's an amazing scene. I love it. I, I, I love it. Love it. So the, I have I yes. have something to, to add with that too. <laughs> add to that pizza. Uh, there's a music song or music video, I guess, uh, in Spanish called <laughs> Señorita Cara de Pizza. <laughs> and if you actually Googled this House 4, I'm Your Pizza Man, there is a, <laughs> essentially a pizza face guy. And the essentially what happens in this song is that the guy falls in love with Pizza Face, the girl, the, the lady Pizza Face, and uh, at the end of it, he eats her because she was so delicious. But uh, this this made me think of that. Just it's this is perfect. Thank you. Please. Outstanding. Thank you're you. welcome. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, and so if you're a fan of gorging yourself until you explode, uh, and I actually Monty Python's been brought up numerous times over this uh, the course of the month. Um, but, uh, I believe this is in the meaning of life. Uh, there is a segment in that, that is famously titled Mr. Creosote. And I would say in the restaurant. <laughs> yeah, is, what's the restaurant? No, is it in a restaurant with a really, really big dude? Oh yes. It's in a restaurant. <laughs> yes. And <laughs> I know. The, he just keeps ordering food bucket. He, when he, he, it's a very large, robust man. And, uh, they bring him a menu, and uh, they said, oh, it's a very fine dining establishment. He's in a tuxedo. And they ask him, oh, so uh, what would you like? And he goes, I'll have the lot. <laughs> 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 and so he ordered everything on the menu. And uh, the whole rest of the skit is him proceeding to eat everything and then explode violently. I, uh, it, it's definitely worth the price of admission. There's a couple food scenes. Salmon moose uh, kills everybody at a dinner party. Uh, later on in the in the movie, uh, Monty Python they know how to do food, one hundred percent know how to do. <laughs> um, but here's my coup de gras, and uh, I think Regina, shout out Regina, I think she's a fan of this as well. 1985's the stuff, <laughs> the, <laughs> the stuff uh, stars uh, stars uh, Michael Moriarty, um, uh, directed by Larry Cohen and written by Larry Cohen. And uh, so this is, uh, if you hate corporations and uh, you hate killer... The man. The man, and you hate killer soft serve, <laughs> this is the movie for you. <laughs> uh, so uh, the man, big big, big food, big processed food, introduces, uh, it is literally marketed as the stuff. 
and it's this taste sensation sweeping the nation. And uh, Patrick, I know you have some experience with this movie. Why don't you, uh, why don't you tell everybody what's about? <laughs> the stuff um my experiences with the stuff well i know that like, as you mentioned like regina every time we've seen it she says that uh she wants to taste it <laughs> i do she too wants to... <laughs> <laughs> she wants to know what the big deal about the stuff is <laughs> but uh the stuff actually it has some really cool scenes too talking about head it explosions does. and whatnot it has uh, uh garrett morris garrett morris but uh he ends up ingesting the stuff and uh yeah, it gets pretty. It, gets, it also has speaking of mafia movies of a uh, Goodfellas fame. It has um, Paul Giamatti. Is it, it does. Paul Giamatti. Yeah, Holy shit. He's a, Paul yeah, Sorvino. Paul Sorvino. 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 I think Paul Giamatti might be a real mobster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Paul, 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 Paul Sorvino is, and he's like a military. He's a like a five star over the top general. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the stuff is amazing. It's a cheesy eighties horror movie. Um, Larry Cohen did a Cue the Winged Serpent, right? I believe so, yes. Yeah, which is another horror classic. But uh, yeah, that movie, I've never wanted to try this stuff. Like, I, I see, I've <laughs> well, seen I've the never... results. <laughs> I've seen what happens with it. So I would I would stay away from the stuff. But I would certainly like to see someone else try it and they can tell me what it's like. Oh, I would love to brew like a pure white beer that looks like milk and just, <laughs> I'm just going to call it this stuff. Don't ask how it's going to You know what else? <laughs> <You> know... <laughs> You know what else disgusts me in movies? Like whenever there's a scene, I can't, um, I can't think of a particular movie off the top of my head, but I think the Deer Hunter they do it. But anything involving sticking something under people's fingernails and bamboo shoots is kind of the the, the obvious one. But yeah. when there's close-ups of that, that makes me kind of like that makes me shudder a dude, lot. Like that, dude. I was pulling weeds out at work the other day, and it was one was by like a big telephone pole, and as I reached down to get it, I got one of those underneath my fucking fingernail uh, off the... and it was so big and gnarly that i was like i was easily able to pull it out like right then in that moment but i like it's like my i'm just uh just shuddering i'd like ugh, no i can't I don't think <laughs> it, it's funny like something we, we were we were talking about you know eating crap and uh drinking this <laughs> stuff and a little thing like a, a sticker going under your nail is what all of us are like oh my god that's disgusting <laughs> every saturday you can find us here um the rest of the week you can go to adventures in where you can find all our other podcasts we have a uh, talking tauntauns which is our star wars podcast poor taste wrestling which is our uh, boxing podcast and um our general comics podcast um you can also just catch up with our reviews and leave your thoughts adventures and movies is now on youtube so you can check us out uh also we have a little side a side hustle we're working on it's called um adventures and movies looks at dot 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 last week we looked at a uh, 499 this week we're looking at a romantic dramedy called i will make your make you mind and uh, of course you can go to site and check out all the star wars news that we have there and you can follow us at a you can follow Adventures in Movies on Twitter over at AAPT Movies, or you can follow us individually while you're looking at food porn. You can file, uh, find Nathaniel on Instagram, or Pat, as I like to call him, at Nathan Port Taste. You can find me, Danny, on Twitter and Instagram at default underscore player. You can find Blake the Crunch on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get that at all, but I love it so much. It's real good. Oh, and I'm gonna be looking at regular porn this week. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I still haven't done your for your handle. Oh, for my right horror. Don't worry about it. Who cares? Okay. <laughs> Who cares? Who cares? <laughs> So next week, get your goddamn aluminum foil fucking hat on. We're gonna do some conspiracy movies. That sounds fun. Check it out. Yeah, and you could check that out on uh Apple Podcasts or Spotify or maybe Stitcher. Who knows? Uh, you can definitely go to the website and you'll find our podcast there. You can find Adventures in Movies Looks at there. Uh, just uh, make sure to give us a rating or tell a friend to listen. And that's our cue. We'll talk to you next week. That's the right stuff. Bye.